we are able to become, uh, as it were, to go to a, a level at which our own life is seen in its total context in the universe. That is to say... In, in terms of our lived experience, we are simply consciousness and its contents. My consciousness is presented to me more directly than anything else in the world. If this is an illusion, then the illusion is consciousness. Now, it's very easy to get confused about this because scientists and philosophers spend a lot of time trying to understand consciousness. Uh, some say, okay, that's Descartes, they ridicule him. They say, now that we know about the brain, we know how the neurons work, the spites of activity, the synapses, the chemical compositions, the complexity. In third-person terms, in terms of brain processing, for instance. That out of that complexity of 100 billion neurons and trillions of connections, consciousness can emerge. Still an illusion. Maybe consciousness emerges from something else. I mean, this is a further question downstream, but the number one datum of the science of consciousness and the philosophy of consciousness is there is consciousness. Now, is it a primitive? Is it the first element of reality? Or is it something derivative? Is it sort of a second element of reality that somehow emerges from the brain? Professor Hilary Putnam of Harvard University. Uh, I think in a conversation we had a couple of days ago, you mentioned, described this as a treasure chest view, and I like that picture. Because here's this big chest that we're just filling up. It's an accumulation, and you don't have to subtract, you don't have to take out. Occasionally you make a little mistake, but basically the idea is, or to shift the metaphor, like building a pyramid. You put down the ground floor, then the next floor, then the next floor, and it, it just goes up. That's part of it. This uh, view of knowledge is growing by accumulation. And so... Everybody acts as if they're, they have potential, unrealized potential. I am here with Jordan Peterson. Jordan, thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. I think a good starting point is this. It actually leads directly into this claim about not being Darwinian enough, but it, it's the concept of truth. I've heard you say in a variety of ways that religious truth isn't scientific truth, and that the difference here is that science tells you what things are and that religion tells you how you should act. I find so often the difficulty in Jung's ideas lies in his theory of history, which is, I feel, a hangover from 19th century theories of history encouraged by Darwinism, namely that there's a sort of orderly progression from the ape through the primitive to the civilized man. So let, let's talk about that, and I think that does connect to this Darwinian concern of yours. Yeah, that's a good... That Well, um, I'm going to approach that obliquely to begin with. So I've been thinking a lot about the essential philosophical contradiction between a Newtonian worldview, which I would say your view is nested inside, and a Darwinian worldview, because those views are not the same. They're seriously not the same. And of course, naturally at that time, that was all hitched in with the theory of progress. The other part of it is the idea that the special success of the sciences, and obviously what we're impressed by is success. This culture values success, and science is a successful institution. So let me throw a couple of propositions at you, and, and I know that you don't accept Hume's distinction between an is and an ought, you know, that you're willing to challenge that, and like, fair enough, you know, it's a reasonable thing to try to challenge, although it's quite difficult, but that doesn't mean it's impossible. But, but there's the idea that science owes its success to using a special method, and that comes partly from the history of science, from the fact that Newton, for example, lived after Bacon and was influenced by Bacon, and the idea that empirical science has grown up together with something called inductive logic. And this idea that there's a method, the inductive method, and that the sciences can be characterized by the fact that they use this method and use it explicitly and consciously, as it were, not unconsciously, as maybe someone who's learning cooking might be using it, but pretty deliberately and explicitly. So I think that these two things, the idea of knowledge is growing by accumulation and growing by the use of a special method, the inductive method, are the key elements of the old view. There are still large numbers of non-scientists who go on thinking that that's how scientists think, but of course they no longer do, do they? I mean, this has started to break down. I think it started to break down. I think it started to break down with Einstein. Yes. If I can drag in a, a bit of history philosophy, screaming by the hair, Kant did something in philosophy, which I think has begun to happen now in science. He challenged a certain view of truth, 
Before Kant, no philosopher really doubted that truth was simply correspondence to reality. I mean, Dar the Darwinian view, as the American pragmatists recognized, so that was William James and his crowd, recognized almost, almost immediately was a form of pragmatism. And the pragmatists claimed that the truth of a statement or process can only be adjudicated with regards to its efficiency with, in attaining its aim. In a different word, some philosophers spoke of agreement. But the idea is a mirror theory of knowledge. Today, I think, for, to, well, Kant said it isn't so simple. There's a contribution of the thinking mind. Sure, it isn't made up by the mind. Kant was no idealist. It isn't all a fiction. It isn't something we make up. But it isn't just a copy either. What we call truth depends both on what there is, on the way things are, and on the contribution of, of the thinker, the mind. Say, the Chinese symbolism of the positive and the negative, the yang and the yin. You know, you've seen that symbol of them together like two interlocked fishes. I think that today scientists have come to a somewhat similar view, that is, since the beginning of the 20th century, the idea that there's a human contribution, a mental contribution to what we call truth. The theories aren't simply dictated to us by the facts, as it were. I'd like to ask you to unpack that a little, because I think that some of our viewers will find this idea a little puzzling. Um, how can it be, some people will ask themselves, that what is and is not true can be, depend not only on what the facts are, but on the human mind? How can that be? Well, let me use an analogy with vision. We tend to think that what we see just depends on what's out there. But the more one studies vision, either as a scientist or as a painter, one discovers that what's called vision involves an enormous amount of interpretation. The color we see as red is not the same color in terms of wavelengths at different times of the day. So that even in what we think of as our simplest transaction with the world, just looking at it, we are interpreting, you know. Uh, in other words, we bring a whole number of things to the world that we're not directly conscious of, usually, unless we turn inwards and start examining them. That's right. I think the world must have looked different in the Middle Ages to someone who looked up and thought of the stars as up and us at the bottom, for example. Today, when we look out into space, I think we have a different experience than somebody with the medieval worldview. And, th and what you're saying is that the very categories in which we see the world and interpret our experience and the, the ideas within which we organize our observations and the facts around us and so on are provided by us so that... The world as conceived by science is partly contributed by external facts, but also partly contributed by categories and ways of seeing things which come from the human observer. That's right. You know, something like this. That is the typical sort of shape that we are having to deal with all the time. And I think you'll see at once that a shape like that is extraordinarily difficult to talk about. This might be called a matrix. A line crossed, lines crossed by lines in a very formal, simple pattern. But what we are doing is we are making a very, very abstract model of the way in which that line is shaped or in which that flea is crawling. And an example of that in science, uh, I'll oversimplify, but it's not basically falsified, is this wave particle business. Check it out! I'm pixelized! If we have a form of this kind... Now that's better. The number of pixels to create a picture is called the resolution. A rather wiggly form. As I've sometimes said, the natural world is full of wiggly forms. And science, in dealing with the natural world, is an attempt to describe them exactly. The higher the pixel count, the better the resolution. We've come a long way with pixels. The original Pac-Man game had a resolution of 224 by 288 pixels. Now we have screens of way more pixels. There are four main resolutions. We have standard definition, high definition, full high definition, and ultra high definition. And if we were, for example, to fill in, in the light gray area, the squares over which the form passes, we should get a rather rough, but still approximate, formal equivalent 
of the original figure. When we talk about screens being 480p or 1080p, we're talking about the height in pixels. And a 1080p screen is 1920 pixels wide. That means there's over 2 million little dots making up that screen. But you notice in the top left-hand corner of the screen that where the squares are drawn much more finely, you get a greater approximation to the original figure. A few years ago, to get full HD, you had to get one of these big screens, like this 23-inch monitor. With advances with technology, you can get the same screen resolution with this small phone. Now that's progress. In other words, the whole method of scientific description is one of, shall we say, putting things in boxes. Have you ever heard of megapixels? A megapixel is one million pixels. Basically, this is the act of classification. The iPhone 6 camera is eight megapixels. The more megapixels, the better your picture. Of representing the complex forms of the world in terms of simpler, regular forms that we can understand. Some companies are testing cameras with 75 megapixels. Regular forms that we can count, measure, classify, and so on. That's a lot, but did you know that the human eye has a resolution of 576 megapixels? And in this way, we get a well-controlled description of physical reality. If you think that's a lot, get this. The eagle's eye is the strongest one in the animal kingdom. So you could say that in a way, science is the art of definition, of getting things down, as we say, in black and white. Their average eyesight is estimated to be four to eight times stronger than the human eye. Now that's a lot of megapixels. Of assimilating the unknown, the irregular, and the wayward to patterns that are known, regular, and controlled. Pixels might be small, but if you have enough of them, they can show amazing things. And basically, this is really the whole operation of that distinctively human activity that we call thought, because thought is fundamentally classification, and so also science is classification. We, have a, we live in a space, the physical space, in which there are only three dimensions. There's the dimension of height, of width, and then in perspective, we can represent the dimension of depth. And we feel that in the real world, in the physical space with which we are familiar, we can only have three right angles drawn about a point. The right angle between height and width, the right angle between depth and height, and the right angle between depth and width. But, of course, the mathematician can, in theory, think of an infinite number of right angles around this point in a kind of imaginary space that we cannot visualize with our senses. And he can say, for instance, that a line drawn this way is also at right angles to all the other dimensions and go on and on and on, uh, inventing an apparently fantastic space which has infinitely many dimensions. Now, it may so turn out that this speculation, this construction of a fantastic pattern, does have some actual application to nature. And the mathematical equations which are concerned with spaces of infinitely many dimensions are actually applicable to fluctuations in prices and things of that kind. But this was an entirely unexpected application. So the fundamental task of science is to invent patterns and see uh, in applied science whether these patterns enable us to comprehend the behavior of the physical world. It's not that there's something, an electron, which is some half a wave and half a particle, that would be meaningless, but that there are many experiments which can be described two ways. You can either think of the electron as a wave, or you can think of it as a particle, and both descriptions are in some crazy way true and adequate. There's another sense in which uh, patterns may be used to explain things. Supposing I draw such a figure as this and ask the question, what is it? Now, there are various ways of explaining this figure and making 
what appears to be, at the moment, a sort of nonsensical abstraction, the very sort of thing we run across in the natural world, of making some sense of it. Now, supposing I say, that is a drawing of a tree trunk with lopped off branches on it. There are alternative ways of describing the same facts, and both descriptions are accurate. That's right. Philosophers have started talking of equivalent descriptions. Mm -hmm. There's a term used in philosophy yeah. of science. This immediately, in your mind, makes sense of the picture because it has related it to something with which you're familiar. In another sense, it has classified it. It has given an intelligible pattern to these lines which I scratched out on the board. But supposing we offer another explanation of it and say, it's a bear climbing a tree. Of course, the bear is hidden behind the tree. This gives you an entirely different picture of the same original drawing. And so, in the same way, when the scientist explains various natural phenomena, uh, let's say we see a partial eclipse of the sun. Now, if you, if you are a member of a culture which firmly believes that eclipses of the sun are the result of the sun being eaten up by a dragon, you will see something here corresponding to what you see in this drawing when you say, oh, it's a bear climbing a tree from behind. You will have in your mind's eye a highly complex and elaborate uh, version of what's going on here, something in fact like this. There will be the dragon eating up the sun. Now, you won't perhaps actually visualize that dragon in the same way that when I tell you that this is a bear climbing a tree, you will almost, uh, you know, see the bear behind it. You know, here he is. Almost in your mind's eye, you see that bear. And almost in your mind's eye, if you really believe that a partial eclipse of the sun is caused by a dragon, you will uh, believe that you see the dragon. But on the other hand, if the scientist explains it more simply and says a partial eclipse of the sun is simply caused by the moon crossing the sun, you will have a simple picture like that in your mind's eye. You can't explain away consciousness. Well, you can. It depends on how you structure your initial presumptions about the world. But the reality of consciousness is first person. So these are the ways in which the scientist is giving an account of the world. He is assimilating things that we don't know, patterns that we don't understand, to patterns that we do understand. Now when talking about this, I like to use the philosopher Thomas Nagel's formulation that a creature is conscious if there's something that it's like to be that creature. So the question arises further in exploring what is the function of science. To ask, why do we want to do that? Why do we want to be able to describe the world in terms and in patterns that we can understand? It's a, whether or not we can judge a creature to be conscious from the outside is never quite the point. Okay, so we, we can't deal with subjectivity within the confines of our materialist theories. And that's partly because those theories are predicated on the elimination of subjectivity as an a priori move. And surely the answer is that if we can interpret the unknown in terms of the known, if we can describe what is going on in the world in regular patterns, we can predict what things are going to do next. But now, for a couple of hundred years uh, after Newton, Educated Western man thought that what Newton had produced was objective fact. Right. The whole point of objective science is to remove subjectivity. Okay, so then it gets removed and, while well, you're surprised about it. It's like, well, no, you can't be surprised about it. You removed it right at the beginning. Now, this, this gets at this, this split between first and, and third person. He had discovered laws which governed uh, the workings of the world and the workings of the universe and the Newton deterministic claim and the, and the materialist objective claim that science is true in some final sense. And this was just objectively true independently of us, that Newton and other scientists had read these facts off of nature by observing it and looking at it and so on. We are breaking it up into little bits, whereas in fact it is not a lot of little bits. It is a continuous sweep. But by treating it in this way, as if it were broken up into bits, we are measuring it, we are making a maya. But you could think about it this way. You could think about the self as the, as the total of what you are now, plus the total of all those things that you could still be. And these cross lines are a maya, just in the same way as the idea of the lion 
The Leo constellation in the stars is a Maya, a way of projecting. You see, this thing, it comes out of our minds, and we project it upon nature like this. So it would be you as a reality, plus you as potential. And that's a strange idea, right? Because we don't really know how to understand the idea of potential as modern empirical people, because potential, virtually by definition, is not yet manifest, and also not a straightforward thing to either measure or conceptualize, by the same token. And break nature into bits, so that it can be easily talked about and handled. Well, the great game, I mean, the whole pretense of most societies is that these two fishes are involved in a battle. There's the up fish and the down fish, the good fish and the bad fish, and there's out for a killing, and the white fish is one of these days going to slay the black fish. But uh, when you see into it clearly, you realize that the white fish and the black fish go together. They're twins. They're really not fighting each other. They're dancing with each other. That, you see, though, is a difficult thing to realize in a set of rules in which yes and no are the basic and formally opposed terms. And th these statements which made up science were simply true. Now, there came, didn't there, a period in the development of science, beginning in the late 19th century, when people began to realize that these statements were not uh, entirely true, that this wasn't just a body of objective fact which had been read off from the world. In other words, that science was corrigible, scientific theories could be wrong. And that raises some very profound questions. I mean, if science isn't just an objectively true description of the way things are, how do you determine whether or not a theory is true? If science isn't just an objectively true description of the way things are, what is it? Then you ask yourself, well, what do you mean by true? Well, then you're in trouble. And if we don't get it from observing the world, where do we get it from? Well, I don't want to say we don't get it from observing the world at all. Mm. And some people disagree, they criticize what we are, are claiming to be true, and we go back and forth. and. All we ever have is this kind of ever-expanding horizon line of successful conversations that allow us to do things technologically that are very persuasive. Okay, because I think you can take a Newtonian perspective on that, or a Darwinian perspective, but you can't do both at the same time. And then if you're smart enough, you can always figure out a way that some complex phenomena is related causally to some simpler motivation. It's not the attempt to explain something, it's the attempt to reduce everything to one simple principle that you can be master of. When it is explicit in a set of rules that yes and no, or positive and negative, are the fundamental principles, it is implicit but not explicit. There's an implicit assumption that's what's out there. That there is this fundamental bondage or fellowship between the two. In objective space is what's real. Okay, well, but the problem with that is, is that that's an assumption about reality. Now, it's obviously a powerful assumption. The core doctrine of Christianity, in some sense, is the truth buttresses you most thoroughly against the vicissitudes of being. That's your salvation, the truth. I think that the basic issue here and where I disagree with you is you seem to be equivocating on the nature of truth here. You're using truth in two different senses and finding a contradiction that I, that I don't in fact think exists. So, Hillary Putnam. I'm Hillary Putnam. And the other, Richard Rorty. Richard Rorty is uh, a pragmatist in the sense that of, of being a neo-pragmatist. Let's talk about, about pragmatism and Darwinism briefly for a second. So I've spent a lot of time in the, the thicket of, of pragmatism because I was a student of Richard Rorty's at Stanford, and I took every class he taught and just basically did nothing but argue with him about pragmatism. So I'm very familiar with this way of viewing the concept of scientific truth. I'm not so sure our audience is deeply schooled in this. So briefly, let me just add a little to how you describe pragmatism. And this is, you know, Rorty was one of the leading lights of pragmatism, as, as you know, so this, his view may be slightly idiosyncratic, but it was fairly well subscribed among pragmatists, and he was influenced by Dewey, and he linked his view in some similar ways to, to a Darwinian conception of truth, but not quite the way you're doing, it seems to me. The idea is that we can never stand outside of human conversation and talk about 
reality as it is or truth as it is. We never, we never come into contact with naked truth. All we have is our conversation and our tools of augmenting our conversation, scientific instruments and otherwise. And all we really have, the, the currency of, of truth, is whatever successfully passes muster in a conversation. So I say something that I think is true, and it seems to work for you. We have a similar, we're playing a similar language game. Every philosopher feels, and this is a, to the credit of analytic philosophy, that if analytic philosophy didn't live up to this great dream, that the new science, or the new science plus the new logic, a dream that Russell very much felt, for example, in the pre-World War I period, I didn't pan out. Nevertheless, uh, we learn more about why and how, how difficult they are and why they're so difficult. So as you say, we can build hydrogen bombs. And so the conversation about the structure of the atom, at the very least, the conversation about the amount of energy hidden in the otherwise nebulous structure of an atom, that becomes you know, very well grounded in facts that we, that we all can agree are, are intersubjectively true. And that is maybe the lasting philosophical progress. We have a deeper insight into the issues, and also we have more possibilities, which we have to sort out. And Rorty says nonsense. When people ask what philosophy is good for, I don't think one can do anything except say philosophy is the following series of books, starting with Plato and coming on down, all those things that Whitehead called footnotes to Plato. These books have influenced the way human beings have thought of themselves, the way they've organized themselves into social groups in various ways. Uh, the game is over. The older conventional view that we could answer the questions that classic philosophy had posed is just a kind of self-deception. Philosophy in that sense is over. Uh, well, one of the people who's uh, made that claim, at least implicitly, is Richard Rorty. Uh, that, that philosophy is a kind of literature, that, uh, that uh, science is a kind of literature, uh, a movement which has been very heavily influenced by uh, French literary criticism, uh, more specifically the work of Jacques Derrida. Yeah, well, that seems, to, that seems to weaken the claim that it's just within language, you know, which is kind of a postmodern claim, too, because it's very difficult for me to believe that the hydrogen bomb is what it is just because we agree what it is in conversation. You know, it, it immediately yeah. reflects a world outside of, now that outside of language, that doesn't mean we, we get permanent and omniscient access to that world, but, but it's more than language as far as, so maybe I'm misunderstanding Rorty or, or, um, I think you're, you are understanding him. He just, he will say that again, all we ever have is our effort to organize the way the world seems to us with concepts and language, and we just have successful iterations of that and unsuccessful ones. And a hydrogen bomb explosion, no matter how big, assuming we survive it, still falls within this empirical context of an evolving language game. And I agree with you that this does, it does connect with postmodernism in a way that is decidedly unhelpful. And, and Rorty was a fan of Derrida and Foucault and you know, I remember walking out of Derrida's lecture at Stanford. I literally had to, to climb over the bodies of the credulous who were sitting in the aisles listening to the great man speak, and he didn't speak a single intelligible sentence, as far as I recall. Well, that's obviously just because you don't have the profundity to understand, uh, you know, a postmodern French neo-Marxist intellectual. I don't. But to get back to some of your claims here, there's this claim you're making about the Darwinian basis of truth and knowledge, that there really is just survival, right? There's just you know, biological change selected against by an environment, and there is what works in that context, what is pragmatic in that context biologically, and there's what doesn't, and what doesn't gets you killed. Yeah. Now, obviously, that picture of, of how we got here is something that I agree with. Right. But our conception of truth and our conception of truth in general and scientific truth specifically and, and even of Darwinian evolution within that subset of truth claims, that is not functioning by merely 
Darwinian principles. And this just goes to... Right, but that, that could be an objection to its validity. Like, there's no reason to assume, and, and I, don't get me wrong, like, I'm perfectly happy with science. I'm a scientist. And, um, but there's no reason to assume that our, our view of the world, our current scientific view of the world, isn't flawed or incomplete in some manner that will prove fundamentally fatal to us. As a working assumption, we can decide not to worry too much about that, and that's fine. But yes, I agree, and more fundamental than that, and I think this is the accurate version of the claim you're making. This is something that I, I spoke about on another podcast with Max Tegmark, a physicist from MIT. The, there is just the fact that within the Darwinian conception of how we got here, there's no reason to believe that our cognitive faculties have evolved to put us in error-free contact with reality. That's not how they evolved. I mean, we, we did not evolve to be perfect mathematicians or perfect logical operators or perfect conceivers of scientific reality at the very small you know, subatomic level or at the very large cosmic level or at the very old cosmological level. We are designed by the happenstance of evolution to function within a very narrow band of, of light intensities and physical parameters. The things we are designed to do very well are, you know, recognize the facial expressions of apes just like ourselves and to throw objects in parabolic arcs within a hundred meters and, and all of that. And so right. the fact that we are able to succeed to the degree that we have been in creating a vision of scientific truth and the structure of the cosmos at large that radically exceeds those narrow parameters, that is a, it's a kind of miracle. It's an amazing fact about us that seems not to be true, remotely true, of any other species we know about. And that's, that's something to be celebrated, and it's a lot of fun to see how far we can get in that direction. But I would grant you that there are no guarantees as we move forward in that space. And in fact, we should be skeptical about how easy we can have it in this space. Yes. One thing that Max Tagmark said, which I thought was fascinating, he, he goes one step further than I had tended to go along these lines, where he said that we should expect, as just based on accepting the, the logic of evolution, we should expect that we will have our common sense intuitions frequently and really incessantly violated by what we discover to be true about the nature of reality through science. Yeah, well, you know, so when he says we should stop talking about reality in the world and truth and all those categories, it's a, it's a clear statement that any statement could be of, of, of the postmodern mood. You never really get down to a point where you can say this is a, uh, a point at which we can stand or which we can be successful in terms of operation because there's an infinite reinterpretability called for. So their idea was that truths are always bounded because we're ignorant, and every uh, action that you undertake that's goal-directed has an internal ethic embedded in it, and the ethic is the claim that if what you do works, then it's true enough, and that's all you can ever do. I think this is a very important point in, liter in the analysis of literature, but in terms of, say, the philosophy of technology, in terms of uh, inquiry into the sciences, uh, and in fact, in terms of everyday life, we do have certain platforms on which we can stand. They're not ultimate, they're not foundations. But we do have certain platforms on which we can stand to be able to build further platforms. Uh, and to say that, for instance, uh, there needs to be infinite reinterpretability of the Golden Gate Bridge, uh, I think is wrong. The fact is that, that technical artifacts uh, have a certain kind of warrant and they have a certain kind of assertability. I would prefer just being called a pragmatist instead of a neo-pragmatist. Putnam, for example, and he spent a lot of time with Dewey recently. What people call neo-pragmatism in my stuff and in Hillary Putnam's stuff, for example, is linguistified pragmatism. I don't call myself a pragmatist. For one thing, I don't like the pragmatist theory of truth, which they were too proud of. And what Darwin did 
as far as the pragmatists were concerned, was to put forth the following proposition, which was that it was impossible for a finite organism to keep up with a multi-dimensionally transforming landscape, environmental landscape, let's say. And so the best that could be done was to generate random variants, kill most of them because they were wrong, and let the others that were correct enough live long enough to propagate, whereby the same process occurs again. So it's not like the organism is a solution to the problem of the environment. The, the organism is a very bad partial solution to an impossible problem. Okay, and the thing that, the thing that about that is that you can't get outside that claim. Now, I can't see how you can get outside that claim if you're a Darwinian, because the Darwinian claim is that the only way to ensure adaptation to the uh, unpredictably transforming environment is through random mutation, essentially, and death. And that there is no truth claim whatsoever that can surpass that. You know, if, if you want a piece of evidence that our theories about the subatomic structure of reality are accurate, you don't really have to look much farther than a hydrogen bomb. Putnam represents the whole of thinking which says we're making slow progress toward some kind of a valid and adequate picture of all the philosophical questions. And it was highly convenient for the cultures of Western Europe, which were then a one up on everybody else, to consider themselves in the van of progress. The classic questions are still with us. We're still working at it. There have been a lot of false starts. But we are making progress. And when they visited the natives of Borneo and Australia and so on, be able to feel that they were perfectly justified in appropriating their lands and dominating them because they were giving them the benefits of the last word in evolution. And uh, therefore, under the influence of that sort of theory of history, which is felt in the work of both Freud and Jung, Jung generated up a category to account for that. One gets the feeling of there being a kind of progressive development of human consciousness. And Jung is charitable enough to assume that because the Chinese and Indian civilizations are immeasurably older than ours, they've had the, poss the possibility of far more sophistication in psychic development, even though he feels, and probably rightly, that there are things they can learn from us. But the fear is, you see, that if people find that out, they won't play the game anymore. I mean, supposing a, a certain social group finds out that its enemy group uh, which it's supposed to fight, is really symbiotic to it. That is to say, the enemy group fosters the survival of the group by pruning its population. We'd never do to admit that. We'd never, never do to admit the advantage of the enemy, just as George Orwell pointed out in his uh, Fantasy of the Future 1984, that uh, a dictatorial government has to have an enemy, and if there isn't one, it has to invent one. And... Uh, by this means, by having something to fight, you see, having something to compete against. The energy of society to go on doing its job is stirred up. And what the Buddha or Bodhisattva type of person fundamentally is, is one, he's one who's seen through that, who doesn't have to be stirred up by hatred and fear and competition to go on with the game of life. And some people disagree, they criticize what we are, are claiming to be true, and we go back and forth. and. All we ever have is this kind of ever-expanding horizon line of successful conversations that allow us to do things technologically that are very persuasive. So as you say, we can build hydrogen bombs. And so the conversation about the structure of the atom, at the very least, the conversation about the amount of energy hidden in the otherwise nebulous structure of an atom, that becomes you know, very well grounded in facts that we that we all can agree are are intersubjectively true. Yeah, well that seems to that seems to weaken the claim that it's just within language, you know, which is kind of a postmodern claim too because it's very difficult for me to believe that the hydrogen bomb is what it is just because we agree what it is in conversation, you know, it, Absolutely, it immediately yeah. reflects a world outside of now that outside of language that doesn't mean we we get permanent and omniscient access to that world, but but it's more than language as far as, so maybe I'm misunderstanding Rorty or... The people who are writing footnotes to footnotes to footnotes to Plato are making suggestions about how we might think of ourselves, how we might organize society. But of course, 
so were all the other intellectuals. They're making the same sorts of suggestions. Philosophy is just suggestions of this sort made by people who have read certain books as opposed to the suggestions made by people who have read other sets of books. Or uh, I think you're, you are understanding him. He just He will say that, again, all we ever have is our effort to organize the way the world seems to us with concepts and language, and we just have successful iterations of that and unsuccessful ones. And a hydrogen bomb explosion, no matter how big, assuming we survive it, still falls within this empirical context of an evolving language game. And I agree with you that this does, it does connect with postmodernism in a way that is decidedly unhelpful. And, and Rorty was a fan of Derrida and Foucault. And the idea that philosophy is a science, which would finally answer the question of knowledge, the question of reality, the question of moral values, all things of that kind, that's all gone. You know, I remember walking out of Derrida's lecture at Stanford. I literally had to, to climb over the bodies of the credulous who were sitting in the aisles listening to the great man speak, and he didn't speak a single intelligible sentence, as far as I recall. Well, that's obviously just because you don't have the profundity to understand, uh, you know, a postmodern French neo-Marxist intellectual. I don't. But to get back to... Now then, Putnam said of Rorty... Look, you're a spoiler, you're a, an anarchist, you're a um, nihilist, or, and here's the last dirty word of the bunch, you're a relativist. Again, Rorty says, and this he doesn't deny having said, but that's in print, that uh, as far as I'm concerned, the notion of warrant, justification, is a sociological notion. Now, no prag none of the classical pragmatists was a cultural relativist about warrant. And Rorty is an explicit cultural relativist about warrant and a skeptic about truth. And Rorty says of uh, Putnam, uh, no, my friend, you're the relativist. Uh, I could have been, but I was clever enough to see that relativism is an untenable position, and I didn't ever commit myself to a view uh, which would have justified what you now say. Now, it seems to me that both Putnam and Rorty were right about the other, but not right about themselves. <clears throat> and that in the exchange between them, between Rorty and Putnam, it became clear that both of them were pragmatists of a sort, and that they realized that if pragmatism was going to have another inning, it would have to be uh, on the condition that pragmatism would not be as smug as it had been in the past. Yeah, he did an important job in getting people to read the pragmatists again. He was influential in getting me to read James and to start teaching James. So I'm grateful to him for having called attention to classical pragmatism. But he's, uh, and he's read everything and but uh, he has a philosophy of his own, in which he, Rorianism is a good enough name. He doesn't <laughs> call it pragmatism. <laughs>